He had some heart conditions, which made us worry about the risk of him suddenly dying. It's mind-boggling, really, that somebody's willing to place their life in your hands. These poor patients are waiting and waiting, and you keep thinking, if that was me, that was my mum, that's not fair. I've had a scan. They find, like, a brain tumour. There's a chance that I can make things a lot worse if I'm not choosing the right patient at the right time. We've got a finite amount of resource and a growing backlog of patients, and that's difficult. My first patient is losing vision, so she's going to be the priority patient. When we're trying to pull out all the stops so that we don't have to cancel a patient on the day. When you finish surgery and it's gone well, it's great. I love that feeling. How are you doing? I'm alive. <laughs> you okay? Yeah, it's all gone fine. We're happy, aren't we? Yeah. Oh, my darling. See you soon. Yeah. Champion. Morning, what's that? Morning. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> the lungs are an extremely fascinating organ. They have an amazing filtering system, which is the equivalent of the size of a tennis court wrapped up, neatly folded into the lungs. And it works so well in such a small volume. Costas Papagianopoulos is a senior thoracic consultant operating on the chest and lungs. We've got a full day list with some major operations to do. Having waiting list, it makes me worried. It, it puts a lot of stress on me because I don't see numbers, I see faces. I see people that I know. I care for these people that I have to operate and I'm very obsessed about having them operated. One Morning. Hey, Barry. On Costas' surgery list today is Barry. He has a growth on his right lung. So far, the hospital has been unable to diagnose the cause. So, Barry, we're going through this way. Barry needs a surgical procedure to carry out a biopsy on the growth in his lung. It's been quite a life-changing situation. I'm doing a lot of coughing, and I have had some back pain. I've not been playing sport, I play tennis, I swim, I walk, so that's been curtailed. I've had various procedures. They've all been inconclusive. So I think um, they want to see if it's cancer. If it isn't, I'll be delighted. And particularly when you've um, experienced it already with a good, my good lady who had cancer. We've been through it all, it's been very difficult. With uncertainty about the cause of the growth, as a precaution, Barry has been placed on the cancer pathway. The aim is to get a diagnosis and start treatment within 62 days. So we have an old CT in here, isn't it? Um, it hasn't changed very much, isn't it? Not since 2021, I didn't think yeah? it changed. Yeah, okay. We'll see whether he's lucky. Six weeks ago, Barry's surgery was canceled on the day, and he has now fallen outside the recommended 62 days time frame. Oh, it's quite, you're quite devastated, aren't you? Particularly when you've already got gowned up, ready to go. It does impact, you know, and uh, last man standing, wasn't it? You were, yeah. But, um, we should get to the bottom of it today, and hopefully we can move forward. Yeah. This is his scan. We have been following him up for a period of time, and then we can see that here, on the lower part of the right lung, there is this shadow. It has changed face a little bit, but hasn't disappeared, because we were thinking whether this is an infection or not. We tried on a couple of occasions to take a biopsy from it. We drew blank. We were not able to get a, a solid answer whether it is a cancer or not. We need to take cells from it with an operation. We gave him a priority today. We put him first on the list. I wanted to make sure that we do have a bed capacity for him and I've already warned the people that this is a case that has been canceled before and I don't want to see a cancellation happening for the second time. I felt yeah. sorry for you as well, because uh, you waited and waited. And yeah, I've been waiting what? a long time. And the anticipation of waiting. Before Costas can start the operation, 
he must confirm there is a bed available in the high dependency unit where Barry can recover after surgery. So let's have a look how we're doing with beds. So those ones will stay today in? Yes, yeah. They will stay in HDU. We do have obstacles constantly on a day. You might not have a bed. You might have staff sicknesses. Quite often we'll have to fight to get, to get the patients in hospital and also being able to, to operate them without, without them um, being cancelled. Good morning, Lauren. How are you? <laughs> you just wanted to know about the bed sits. Yeah, what's, ha what's happening? So two are going out, yeah. which means we have We've got an HCU. going in. We have one HCU so bed. So we have bed for Barry. For the complex major operation, isn't yeah. it? With a high dependency bed secured, Barry's operation can now go ahead. I think what is important is that when somebody is sick, this can be a very daunting and a very stressful period for people. The most important thing for me is that you're able to give them answers as quickly as possible in order to provide the, the best possible treatment. Right. Round two. <laughs> ah, how are you? All right. Eventually, isn't it? Yeah, thank goodness for that. Eh? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. You, everything all right? Yeah, so far so good. Very good. Very anxious? Somewhat, you know, but obviously I'm positive and... Hmm. Of course, the thing is, I have faith in you and I have faith in my... Thank you very much. I've got my faith as well, you know, so... Lovely. We need some conclusion, don't we? Yes, you're absolutely right. Go. We're going to take that, that problem out, send it off, have a look at it. Yeah. If that proves to be sinister, we will complete it with taking part of your lung out. If not, then that's going to be a bonus. We should switch you up again, will you? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're going to do. Yeah. OK? Yeah. Lovely. The biggest concern I have is the concern of the unexpected. In the vast majority of cases, we, we do not see surprises. But there is a percentage of people where we should be prepared that we might have some unexpected findings. Leeds has one of the largest children's hospitals in the country. They tend to swap the patients around. Hi, we finally meet. <laughs> We've made it. I love it. When the lights go on, theatre's quiet, you can just operate, you don't have to think of anything else. It's the pandemonium before that is exhausting. Adele Fishlock is one of eight orthopaedic consultants in the paediatric department. She specialises in treating children with neuromuscular disorders. I see children with lots of different problems. A lot of them have problems with mobility. She's completely dislocated now. Their hips moving out of position. And the other big problem they get is deformity within the feet. I've gone through the orthopaedic waiting list for paediatrics. So we've got 54 neurological patients. Yeah, majority of which are the hips to get through. Yeah. So just looking at this week, obviously we've got a list on Friday. I'm just, I'm already feeling anxious whether we're uh, going to get two inpatient beds. Getting a patient on the list is the easy bit. It's getting them to a theatre room, to an anaesthetic room, and anaesthetising into theatre that's the hard bit. You're relying on having enough theatre staff. You're relying on kit. Biggest thing is having a bed. You need your stars to align, basically. I mean, we're under considerable pressure. We just have to work around it as best we can. We just have to show up on Friday morning. Yeah. Oh, black colour on top, blue or green, blue, blue. Like a dark blue. Yeah. Next in Adele's clinic is Max. He needs surgery for a dislocated hip. We'll ask her if you're going to have a machine as well, so that you can press the bottom on it. Yeah, for pain relief. Max was born with cerebral palsy, a neurological condition that affects his movement and coordination. Where will we be going once you're fully better and fully able to transfer to Australia? Yeah. I want. Go on. Who wants to see the great white sharks? <laughs> 
Max, he's always been able to sort of get around by crawling or sort of transferring and using his own body weight to get into his wheelchair um, or into different positions, but because of his hip, it's really impacted. It's made, made him have lots of time off school, not want to do normal activities like he used to do. There's been a lot of pain, haven't you? Yeah. Looking well. Come on in. Right. So last time I saw you was in December when we'd listed you and we'd had a big flare of symptoms, hadn't we? Yeah. We got the MRI scan done that showed these degenerative changes. Yeah. And that's why you're getting the pain. During the lockdown, these children were classed as high risk, so they weren't leaving the house. Obviously, they weren't getting seen in hospital. Physiotherapists weren't often able to have hands-on time because of the isolation. We're now seeing a massive knock-on effect from that. Before, we might have monitored them for longer periods of time. Now they're getting to the point of needing surgery much quicker because they've not had that therapy. This has a massive effect to our whole waiting list. So, this is your X-ray. So the plan is where this femoral neck and femoral head is sitting like that, what we want it to do is sit into that position and hopefully take the pressure off it, which in turn is planned to improve your pain. Yeah. What other the questions did you have? You want to know how long have we special did this for? Yeah. How long have I done this for? <laughs> it's 14 months in fellowship when I mainly did these and then I've done 18 months here where this is my sort of day-to-day -day job in terms of the surgery that I enjoy doing and the one I do most is probably this operation. <laughs> Does that fill you with confidence or not? You're not getting out the door just yet. So. <laughs> we know children with neuromuscular problems are already weak. That's part of their, their pathology. And any surgery that I do is going to weaken them. So there's a chance that I can make things a lot worse if I'm not choosing the right patient to operate on at the right time. Max is due to have surgery in two days' time. How are you feeling, Max? All right. You still feel all right about it? Mm. Yeah. Is that because you know you're in good hands? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling really anxious now. Obviously, it's a massive operation, um, but it is needed. Max has, hasn't been able to enjoy activities with his family. He's missed lots of school days, so we have to stay positive and hope it's going to regain Max's mobility, which is the end goal, ultimately, and to stop him from being in so much pain. Adele will only know on the day of surgery if Max and her other patients' operations can go ahead when there is confirmation that beds are available. The night before any theatre list, I never sleep well, and it's not because of the surgery, it's because wondering, am I actually going to get this child to theatre? Can I help? Your heart beats, on average, for most people, around 100,000 times every day for the whole of your life. And it's quite fascinating how it doesn't go wrong more often. Andrew Hogarth is one of eight cardiologists specialising in the electrical rhythms of the heart. It's usually known as the sort of geeky bit of cardiology. So it's the kind of witchcraft bit. Hello. How's things? Um, tight. And what about the rest of the beds? Are they looking static or are they yes. lab-based? Yeah. Just looking at the bed states, not, not looking rosy. The volume of work we get through as a department is huge. If people come in with emergencies that affect their heart, they could die. So we need to be able to treat heart attacks every minute of every day. We need to be able to open arteries every minute of every day. There's one radiographer down for the labs. Yeah, so they're trying to condense my list. Yeah. It's the acutes, though, isn't it? Is it going to take priority? It's whether we need to cancel electives, isn't it? The cardiology are uh, uh, stone under and we had lots of admissions last night. Fast track. Yeah, he's a fast track. Right, Roger. All ready. Yeah. One recent admission is Roger. He has a heart condition regulated by a device in his chest, similar to a pacemaker. 
Three weeks ago, he developed an infection after a routine procedure. Roger's someone who would be classified as an acute, needs doing ASAP. If we weren't to do it now, then potentially his infection could get worse and his organs will start to fail. Roger's condition can cause his heart to beat dangerously fast. So this is commonly and sadly presents with sudden death. So Roger's had some heart rhythm disturbance which made us worry about the risk of him suddenly dying. To keep him alive, the device known as an ICD is wired into his heart. ICD, that's shorthand for implantable cardiac defibrillator. It's a device not unlike a pacemaker. Those devices can read the electrical information and attached to that device are wires that go down through the veins inside the heart. And if they see danger, they'll try and sort it out. If they can't sort it out, they'll deliver a defibrillation shock internally. Roger first found out about his condition more than 10 years ago after a near-death experience at his gym. I first had a problem with my heart. I had been in a spinning class. I came out of the, the spinning class, didn't feel very well. I kept on getting more and more ill. They phoned for an ambulance. Luckily for me, the ambulance were with me very, very quickly. They gave me an injection. I had a rhythmia of the heart, apparently. Roger had gone off to the gym. The, the gym didn't have a first aider on, and right outside was where um, paramedics happened to sort of pack up, waiting for their next call. So very, very quickly, he was able to get medical attention, and I think it probably saved his life. To find out that he's got a heart condition, it completely knocked both of us and shocked both of us. Roger took the diagnosis much better than I did. I'm prone to worry, and I don't have a magic wand that I can wave and, and somehow fix it. When I had the device put in, I was a deputy manager in a care home for people with learning disabilities. After the event, I left the job and went home and looked after the kids, and my wife went out to work. The kids were quite young, and I think he just thought, if I'm not going to be around, I want to spend more time with the kids. As the years went on, I have to admit, I forgot about the device, I forgot about the condition, and I just got on and lived my life. I think both my children and my wife are more worried than I am. Roger, he's got no off switch. But you've forever got in the back of your mind. Is that something you should be doing? Should he really be cycling sort of 40k? Or you, you just find yourself sort of watching him li lift a washing machine and thinking, is that a good idea? Four weeks ago, the device saved his life. I was actually on a treadmill at the time. I woke up on the back of the treadmill and the device already fired. And as I tried to get up, the device fired again. It gives you an electric shock. It's like someone kicking you very hard. It sort of like brings it back to home that I have this condition and, and um, I need to be careful with what I do. And where will these notes be? For sticker purposes. The team need to remove Roger's device and give him antibiotics to clear the infection before they can implant a new device. During that time, he won't be protected by the device. So there's a risk of him having a cardiac arrest. So what we'll want Roger to do is stay in hospital under observation on cardiac monitoring so we can safely monitor him through that period and get him to the point where we can implant him with his new device to protect him again. Just removing the device carries risk. Roger. Hello again. So, as you know, the root cause of all this is infection on those pacing leads. So we have to take them out and they're attached to your defibrillator box up here. Because it's been in that long, the wires, as they go down through the veins into the heart, will have embedded themselves into the wall of the blood vessels in the heart. So for that reason, it's important that you're asleep. But the thing we worry about is it causing a tear in either in a major blood vessel in the chest or in the heart itself. But if that happens, you can imagine that's a big deal. We always have to be prepared for the most serious complication, which is a laceration of a major blood vessel in the chest or the heart muscle itself, which could lead to life-threatening, catastrophic bleeding very quickly. Let's get through tomorrow, it's a big step, and then we'll plan the next stages from there. No. Yeah. All right, okay, see you later. Okay. okay. Bye now. Lovely. 
Costas is about to start surgery to find out what has caused a growth on Barry's right lung. When a patient is referred to us and has investigations, there is only the very small percentage of people that cannot come up to a conclusion. I think this is one of the most scary things for people to experience. Masha, can we start? Yep. Can I please? Using keyhole surgery, Costas can perform a major complex operation without opening the chest. Let's see where we are here. Top lights on for a second. That's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. This is the lower part of the, of the lung. That looks like almost normal lung. But then when we get into this area, which correlates with a scan that, that I showed earlier on, you see that, how solid it is and how different it is. So here, the surface of the lung is nice and smooth. Here, it's been almost like it's been hurt. Yeah, okay. Hold that for me. Yeah, it looks very suspicious. I think, I think by just looking at it, um, we, we are a little bit, we're a little bit concerned. So, can we take what we need now for a speedy biopsy? Okay. Costas will need to carefully remove a section of lung with the abnormal growth. That's it. On standby are the pathology team who are waiting to analyze the sample. We're slowly cutting the piece of lung that we want that contains a problem, we're cutting it all out. And that's the specimen that the pathologist will receive to be able to give us an answer. Okay, I'll take the specimen. Give me a Roberts, please. Quite no, no boy. Right. <laughs> it looks very, very abnormal. Right, this is right lower lobe. Barry will be kept under anaesthetic until the tests are completed. The results will determine what Costas does next in theater. In the lab, the sample of lung is prepared for the pathologist to analyze. The patients on the table, they need to know now what this answer is. So what we can do is we can freeze it down and cut the sections, and then you'll get an answer within an hour. I'm gonna embed this in cryo medium. So this will support the tissue while I'm freezing it down and then support it while I'm putting the sections. The frozen sample is thinly sliced so it can be closely examined under a microscope. Time's of the essence from us to try and get these results as soon as possible. That's massively beneficial to the patient because they can carry on with the operation, they can make decisions quite quickly on the fly as to what they're doing. I didn't expect it to be like this. Mm. While waiting for the biopsy results, Costas checks to see if there are any other areas with abnormal tissue. The picture looks a little bit different than what it looked on the scan. So I'm getting myself a little bit more worried now. We're seeing that the lymph nodes look a little bit, a little bit stuck into the root of the lung. So I'm just very much worried now that we might be having also lymph glands that they might be involved into that process, being things a little bit harder for him. If the abnormal cells have spread to Barry's lymph nodes, this will be much harder to treat. And you can see it's all right. Let's pick up the phone, see what it's the verdict. Hello, it's Mr. Papas. Hi. You've sent me right lower lobe where it's referred infection. Correct. Thank you very much. We're going to send you a lobe. Thank you. So we do have a confirmation that this is a lung cancer. So we will proceed now in disconnecting the lower lobe from the rest of the lung. When you realize that things are much more advanced than what you were expecting, it is extremely disappointing and extremely upsetting. And I'm thinking of how I'm going to be able to sort out and combat the problem and what are the risks involved with it. To remove as much cancer as possible, Costas must cut out a section of the lung as well as some lymph nodes. 
It looks all very matted, as I would call it. These will be sent to the lab to determine the stage of Barry's cancer. Can we prepare a bag, please? So what we do is to avoid any spillage of cancer, obviously when we remove it from the chest, we put it in a special bag. Scissors, please. Give me the knife, please. Right, top lights on. That is definitely cancer in the lymph nodes. Pure cancer cells here, unfortunately. The scan, when we've done the last one, obviously looked okay. I don't think that there would have been a difference um, in, the, in the outcome because he did have, from what it looked like on the CT scan, a fairly early stage um, cancer. It was also a shadow that had been followed up for a period of time and it hadn't really grown um, substantially. He was unlucky because he belonged into the very small percentage of people that they had undetected disease, as we call it. I thought it would have been just a straightforward um, operation, but I guess that's how things are in surgery. You always have to be prepared for all eventualities. But this is where we are. Unfortunately, that's how, that's how cancer is. Surprises. It's, it's really a pity. Um, I, don't like, I don't like giving bad news to people. Not exactly as we expected today. It's not going to be very happy. It's not just a, a simple case now where the surgery would have done all the treatment with a curative intent. I think now what we have is we have surgery as a first step followed by chemotherapy. Instead of thinking that, oh, this is a completed episode which is unsuccessful, it is, oh, it didn't go as we want it to, but then we do have another alternative. Let's work on it and then we'll move on as a team in order to provide the, the best possible treatment. Today, orthopaedic consultant Adele has three patients on her operating list. Morning, babe. You all right? One is a day case, but the other two will require specialist beds after surgery. Hi, it's just Adele, orthopaedics. You all right? I should have two patients in the book for today. A lot of these children need HDU, so high dependency care afterwards, and the number of beds there is limited at the minute. It's emotionally draining, it's physically draining, running from one end of the hospital, multiple telephone calls. Do we have kit? Do we have enough staff to do this? You just remember why we're having this operation. If we can do that sleep, if she's always in pain. Max, who has cerebral palsy, has arrived to have surgery on his dislocated hip. His operation will take the longest on today's list. We were doing all right, running around the house getting sorted until we hit the car park. You got a little bit upset, didn't you? Mm. There's been a lot of pain. So for this operation, it'll be life-changing for us. Are you OK, Kane? Uh, all right, to be honest. Also on today's list is Kane. He has Duchenne's muscular dystrophy a genetic condition which causes muscle degeneration. He needs surgery on his feet to enable him to stand again using a frame. Kane's got a muscle wasting condition. It starts off in the legs and it progresses through the body, so instead of rebuilding muscle and tissue, the muscle just dies. Is Kane in the day room? He is. Yeah. yeah, lovely. Thank you. It's very difficult at the moment, basically having to carry him everywhere pick him up if he needs a toilet, otherwise it's full-time chair. He only came off his feet probably a year, year and a half ago. Um, up until that, he was mobile as a normal child would be. At the moment, it's very difficult to get shoes on of the angle that his feet are in. You have a, a pair of favourite shoes you're looking forward to getting back on? We used to like Jordans, like Air Jordans, so... Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're looking to get. Fab, how are you doing? Uh, okay. You all right? 
So the plan is, your foot, I'm hopeful we can get it sort of at 90 degrees to the rest of your leg, which is going to make things just a bit easier in your wheelchair. Yeah, but hopefully that'll help with the standing frame because I know that's been a bit of an issue recently, hasn't it, getting into that. Yeah, you're right. I know. Parents with children with neuromuscular problems, I think it's really challenging. You have lots of hospital appointments, physiotherapy. Life is often a struggle, it's difficult. They come to see you, you offer a surgery that you hope will improve their child's quality of life or their pain. And that's vital for these families. I'll take really good care of them, yeah? We've got a really good team on. You're in good hands. Once we get this far, just we want to get it done now, don't we? All right. Yeah. With limited hours in theatre available, Adele needs to start operating as soon as possible if she is to get through all three patients on the list. You all right? Oh, mm. hello. Hi, it's Adele, orthopaedics. Hi, is this a bed manager? OK. We've got a day case first, so we'll crack on with that. Thank you, bye. She's not hopeful, but she's going to ring us back. Right, should we brief for this one at least and feel like we're doing something? Theatre time is so valuable and you need to optimise every single minute. I try and sort of put a strategy in place. So I'll often try and do a day case patient first because I know I don't need to worry about their bed. I can get into theatre and get started. <laughs> With Kane and Max waiting on the admissions ward and the clock ticking, Adele goes ahead with a minor day case from her list. I don't know whether it's uh, being a young consultant, but scrubbing, I always have that, the butterflies in the tummy, but it's always a nice part of the day when you get to scrub because at least you know you're, you're gonna do something and start something. This patient requires minor foot surgery to release tension in the Achilles tendon. The operation only takes 30 minutes, which means they can be discharged later today. Sounds funny in here with no music on, doesn't it? I like a bit of history on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually more useful to have it off for this operation. It's more about hearing and seeing. Ah, there we go. <laughs> That's better. Yeah, much better. And the tendon is still intact, so that is good. With one operation completed, Adele needs to find out if there are beds for her other patients, Max and Kane. Hello. Hi. Oh, bed manager. Brilliant. So, any news about the beds? Amazing. Oh, fantastic. Two beds. Brilliant. Bye. Two beds. Adele must now choose who will be next in theatre. When you've got cases of different complexities, what you're thinking about is how best to utilise the remaining part of your day. But you're often trying to make sure that you've got enough time. We know we've got a finite number of hours in theatre, and what you don't want is to overrun, and then the child gets cancelled. To try and get both children through theatre, Adele decides to proceed with Kane's more routine surgery. But if it overruns, there may not be time to start Max's much longer operation. I'm not too scared. What are you scared of? Yeah. I don't know. It's just strange, you know, having like anesthetic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just... Well, everybody's a little bit apprehensive, but yeah. we do thousands and thousands and thousands of these. I can understand. It's perfectly normal. I feel like that. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to go with it, okay? He's deteriorated quite significantly over a very short period of time, sadly. You do really well. The risks associated with Duchenne's and general anaesthetics are significant. Although it's a quick operation, actually the anaesthetic for these children is massive to get through. It's the first time Dad's been in this position and Kane's been in this position, so you can see the effect that that has on them all. And I get that, I really do. Although the anaesthetic is a risk for Kane, 
the benefit of having surgery could mean he will no longer be confined to a wheelchair. With Kane, I want to get him back in his standing frame. I want for him to have these interactions with his peers on the same level, not always being in his wheelchair. As humans, we all like to interact in an upright position, look our friends, look our family in the eye. And if you can't get into your standing frame, that must have a massive impact on your whole demeanour and the way you feel about yourself. So I'm hoping we'll get him upright, which will be so much better for him. Today, cardiac patient Roger will have the first of two procedures. To start, the team need to remove his infected ICD device, which is wired into his heart and keeps him alive. The consequences of not dealing with infection and devices as soon as possible could be escalating infection, systemic infection, infection that's seeding off the device into other parts of his body, and that's dangerous and life-threatening. As Roger's surgery is urgent, Andrew has been forced to cancel a pre-planned operation on today's list. Right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Chris, I'm a cardiologist. Andrew will be working alongside the clinical director, Dr. Chris Pepper. The first case, he's come back with blood cultures positive staphylococci. In the event of a tear, clearly we call the team up as quickly as possible. An open-heart surgical team is on standby in case of a catastrophic bleed. We'll stand back, but the surgical team will, will take over. It's a big resource to divert to these procedures, but if the worst-case scenario happened and then we didn't have all those pieces in place, then someone may die who didn't need to. This is the bit where everybody wants a piece of you, and my love wants to get you set up. Oh, I can't blame you, can you? No, you, well, you can't. <laughs> so the plan today... First thing we need to do is get into the, the veins at the top of the leg and place a device called a, an occlusion balloon, which may be useful in the event of a tear inside the, the blood vessels. So that's the first step. So I'm going to get on and do that whilst Dr Pepper gets scrubbed. You can take the table up as well, please. If a bleed occurs, the balloon in Roger's artery will inflate to block the blood flow. He will then have emergency surgery. Well, there's something of a sense of apprehension before we start these procedures. It's the unpredictability of them that's the, the challenge. You're never quite sure when you start what sort of case it's going to be. That the balloon works and we know where to inflate it. So all of this is just things that we hopefully will never need to do during this procedure. We need to be prepared for the worst and hope for the best. With the safety balloon in place, they begin to extricate the infected device. Pacemaker defibrillator leads take a route through the veins into the heart, and after a year or two, they start to become embedded within the wall of the veins and the heart, and the body kind of treats them as itself, if you like. We can't just pull on them and pull them out. So we have to ease them out gently with a variety of tools. There's the box. Next, the most high-risk part of the surgery, inching out the lead stuck onto Roger's blood vessel. Imagine that lead's been inside his heart for 15 years, moving with the heart 100,000 times a day, every day. Can I have some laser specs, please? A laser controlled by a foot pedal is used to burn through the heart tissue attached to the lead. OK, laser. <laughs> You can see as that sheath darted forward there, Chris very quickly took his foot off the pedal for the laser because what you don't want to do is any uncontrolled movements. We're getting some tension being put on the heart ventricle, the right ventricle. It's critical the tension on the lead is kept to a minimum to avoid causing a tear in the heart muscle. Amazing energy. That's just jumped on a bit further towards the tip of the lead. Okay, that's the lead three, well done. We're past the danger time. Thanks. Once we've got the lead out, there's a palpable sense of relief in the team. 
cardiologists such as myself do do procedures like putting devices into people, taking them out of people, which are quite hands-on type of things, which is why I love cardiology. It's a very rewarding specialty to be involved in, in terms of how you can help people. Hello, Roger. Yeah. You're in the recovery area now. Okay. It went really well. Roger will now be treated with antibiotics on the ward. Only when the infection is cleared will he be given a new device. You're just coming around from the anaesthetic. You might feel a little bit groggy for a while. Until then, he will remain at risk of having a heart attack. You feel like you've had a drink? <laughs> The house isn't the same because his, his, his absence is literally noticeable. It's hard trying to put out of your mind the things that, that could go wrong. I just try not to think about what life would be like if Roger wasn't here. It's just something I try not to contemplate. With Roger, the period of time between us taking the device out and putting the new one in, we need him monitored continually looking remotely at his heart rhythm and to alert us to any suggestion that there was some dangerous heart rhythm disturbance going on so we can react very quickly to save Roger's life should something go wrong. Back on the ward, Kane is recovering from his surgery. Hello, how are you feeling? Very strange. Very strange. Well, everything went really well, so... See the position that yeah. they're in? Much better than where we started. Yeah. Uh, so I'm really happy with how it Did went. Did you do Keol or...? Yes, so I'm happy for him to get into a standing frame as soon as you feel comfortable to do so, really. Do you have any questions for me? I've just got a little weird tingling in my feet. Yeah, so when I put the local anaesthetic in, okay. it often goes round some of the nerves as well, so that's unsurprising. All right. Thank you. You're very welcome. Take care. Once Kane heals, he will be able to stand again using his frame. With two surgeries completed in time, Adele can now operate on her last patient. Max is a young boy with cerebral palsy in a wheelchair and hoisted. He has got a lot of pain in his left hip, so we're planning to do a left-sided hip reconstruction. Good evening. How are you doing, Max? Yeah, thanks to one. Oh, hi. Yeah. yeah. Max is finally on his way to theatre. Hiya. Hi. It's a bit of visit here then, Max. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we've got Maximus and your bone on the fourth. Is that right? Yeah. Good. <laughs> you haven't got a clue, really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was it again? Uh... Which side are we doing? Yeah, I hope you know. Uh, <laughs> can you point oh, oh, can you point to it? Here. That's it. That's yeah, but which way. one? Which is the sort uh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, It's been a long journey. It's really easy to just see a small part of somebody's journey. What people don't see is the constant hospital appointments, the to and fro in, the phone calls, the pain, sleepless nights. People don't see that we split up as a family so that we can obviously care for our other children and make sure they're not missing out. You know, Dad and I work really well together as a team, but mentally, as a family, we've had to prepare and prepare our other children. If anything happens, I'll come and speak to you straight away, and as soon as I've finished here, I'll leave my colleague to just finish up, and then I'll come and speak to you straight away. But I will, I promise you. I'll take good care of him. All right. I'll see you soon. It's going to be quite challenging. I envisage there's going to be some bleeding. The bone itself bleeds quite a bit, so there will be some blood loss. So it's just about monitoring that throughout. Right, can I have a blood? Tom, are you happy? A piece of bone cut from Max's thigh will be placed into his pelvis to stabilise his hip. If successful, this surgery will relieve his pain and give him more mobility. There's always a bleeder there. <laughs> mm. When you come through fat, uh, that obviously everyone's got on the lateral thigh, it just really bleeds quite a bit. So we're just trying to get the bleeders as we go through. Can I have diathermy up to 20, please? You just want to keep things as dry as possible, so stop the bleeding as much as you can, because if you don't, they, they're prone to get a hematoma, so like a collection of blood which then can become infected. It's all about just being patient and yeah. trying to 
get that Very lit. Exciting. Yeah. The team removes a small section of the thigh bone. So tight. Wow. There we go. There we go. That's the bit we've taken out. The fragment is shaved into a shape that will fit neatly above Max's hip socket. Can I get you to hold that? This one. It is a lot of responsibility operating on children, but it's what we've been trained to do, working together as a team for the best for this child, which to me, it's, it's fantastic. My look, please. Adele uses the piece to push the socket down, preventing the hip from dislocating again. People often uh, say that orthopaedic surgery is a bit like carpentry, and this is like the carpentry bit of the operation. Very controlled form of carpentry. It's very controlled. <laughs> don't say that to my husband, because I'm terrible at DIY, so I don't know what that says about me. That doesn't look bad. When we first started, it was like that. What we're now trying to do is deepen it so it covers it more like that. Ideally, we want to get their hips in a better position that allows them to sit better in their wheelchair. It improves their pain, improves their range of movements, and effectively, hopefully, improve their quality of life. Well, that's come down, yeah? But his bone is quite soft, so we have managed to pull it down. We, and we, we've jammed that piece of bone in to stabilise that osteotomy. Uh, so we're just trying to show that we've, we've covered that femoral head more than it was. Oh, it's lovely, that. Very good coverage of the uh, yeah. yeah, let's call it a day. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to close up now. You all right? Gone really well. Everything looks really good. He's just uh, gone into recovery now. He's done really, really well. You can't beat that feeling when you finish surgery and it's gone well, and that you've actually made an improvement to potentially someone's life. It's tiring, you're exhausted, but you've got them to the end. It's a great feeling. So you can see now where his hip is pushing back into the socket, the ball and socket. Looks so much better, doesn't it, now? Very different. All right. Thank All right, you. no worries. He'll be back Thank round you. soon. It's a nice way to finish, especially a, a Friday <laughs> and the weekend coming, to be happy that you've done a good job. It's been two days since Barry's operation, and Costas must wait for the test results to determine the stage of his lung cancer. I spoke to him the next morning, and I said, look, things are not looking exactly as they, as they were looking when, when we had the, the clinic with you. I said, things are looking a little bit worse. It doesn't mean that the operation um, hasn't worked well for you, but it means also that we haven't finished the journey. Good morning. <laughs> ah, morning, folks. How are you? I'm fine. Good evening. So I've got a pain on this side, which is with you, didn't we? Which to be expected. Yeah. A little bit. So, All right. But apart from that, yeah, you haven't got any results back yet. Please. No, no, no. It is. It is a little bit. It's a little How bit long early. Gonna, it's long it's, it's going to take us. It's going to take some about ten days until we get the final the final results. We know. We know. Obviously, now that this is a lung cancer, but the final staging. It will take us on about seven to ten right. days to get yeah. the results. Then right. we'll have a chat with the rest of the people right. about the best way of managing mm. this. Right. And I'll get you back in the clinic. Did you have to take a large section out? <clears throat> we, we took approximately one third of your right lung away, mm. the section that contained the problem. Right. But it is not only that, we have to do a quite significant digging around the root of the lung to get rid of all the lymph glands which I was right. concerned about. Right. The most important thing is to get you up and running now mm. and, yeah. and get you and get you eventually I was, I was home. Up, up the first day. Very walking good. And, yeah, yeah, and, true. Uh, I think by Sunday we should be ready to consider. If you're home. around you can have a piece of cake. Thank you. My birthday. Fant is it your birthday on, th on Sunday? Sunday. Well then we'll have to light some candles down as yeah. well, isn't it? Before we set you off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so it's gonna be the magic the magic eighty, isn't it? Yeah. Ah, fantastic. Very good. We'll put the wheels in motion for that. Hopefully we should be able to get you by Sunday um, home. 
Um, things are progressing quite well and I'm pleased with that. Either tomorrow or Sunday, we're going to be looking at taking the tube out, celebrate the birthday, get some cake. Okay. And then home. Thanks very much. All right, Mr. good to see you, sir. Okay. Okay. Bye for now. We finally got to the bottom of it. It's not what you want to hear, but we've now got a conclusion. There's no point in sitting down and, you know, crying spilt milk. You're dealt a blow and that's it. And life, life deals you all kinds of blows throughout your lifetime. But I think I'm lucky that I've got to 80. Hopefully on Sunday. I've already told the, asked one of the nurses to get me a birthday cake and I'll give them a piece. You know, celebrate. What is the most important thing for me as a surgeon and as a doctor? I'm not interested in, in treating only people's disease. I'm interested to probe a little bit further and see how much that disease might have affected their mind, how stressed they are, how upset they are, how optimistic they are. Barry, yeah, he's got his 80th birthday on Sunday. Perhaps if he's well enough, we can send him home on Sunday. And I think a large part of our conversation after the treatment has been done is about lifting off the negative thoughts that they might have. For me, it, it is not about treating the body only and the disease that they might have, but it's also treating their mind. After six more days on the ward, Roger is infection free. Now the team must implant a new ICD device into his chest. I'm feeling more anxious than I was last time. Um, I don't know why I'm feeling anxious. Maybe it's just because I'm quite looking forward to getting home. The device will be fitted, which is like an insurance package for me. You know, if something does go wrong, it means that um, I, won't, I won't end up dead. Cardiologists Chris and Andrew need to keep Roger awake to check the device is fully operational. So first stage is making the pocket, which Roger's tolerating very well with a bit of sedation, local anaesthetic. There's always a slightly odd feeling to it the wrong way around on the right. With the device now in his chest, the lead is fed directly into Roger's heart. And from the right side, it is quite tricky to steer the lead across into the right ventricle, which is where we need it to be. You may feel some jumps and bumps there. Got to make sure it's perfect, Roger. With the device connected, the team must test its life-saving function by delivering a 50 hertz volt directly into Roger's heart. For this, he is given heavier sedation. Roger? Roger, can you hear me? So we're going to try and induce dangerous cardiac arrest type rhythm disturbance by effectively replicating what happens if you stick your fingers in a plug socket. The device should detect a fast heartbeat and shock the heart back into normal rhythm. You're good. Let's run your checks then. Yep. If that fails, stand there, everybody. It's a traditional default shot coming. Yeah, I think we're good to go if you guys are ready. OK, so it's going to be 50 hertz coming on now. One, two, three, four, five, off. Device is detecting arrhythmia. It's slowed and terminated itself. Let's just go again, please. Five seconds coming on now. One. Two, three, four, five, and off. Device is detecting arrhythmia. There's good detection. Device is charging. 30 joule shot coming from the device. Be a little jump. And a clean termination. We're back to eight cents BP. Lovely, thank you. Well done, Roger. Sorry, you woke up with a bit of a jump there. Well done. You just drift off back to sleep. Everything is absolutely fine. The successful test means Roger's heart is now protected again. Previously, he's already had a life-saving shock from his device, so we know he's at risk of further problems that could kill him from a heart rhythm point of view. So that device will give us the protection, give Roger the protection to potentially save his life should that happen again. Roger, good evening. How are you feeling? Yep, it's all. 
Mm -hmm. They're tired. Yeah. I'm sure all those things will pass. Good. And it all went absolutely to plan. So the device is implanted with nice result and the test fire was seamless. Cool. So I guess you'd like to go home. I would <laughs> like to go home, yes. Is your wife picking you up? Uh, she's coming to meet me, yeah. Thank See you, you very much. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye, ma'am. I don't just see the heart as a muscle, the heart is a vital organ to keep that person alive. And I see it as something very precious. So when I see those waiting lists going up, you've got to pick that up and turn it around, and you get a fire in your belly to make things better, to improve them. Are you going to tie him a bag or do you want me to carry it? There's been people on these wards waiting a lot longer than I have for operations. And I think I've just been good at looking to get in and get sorted. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Max has returned to Adele's clinic for the first time since his hip operation. <laughs> How are we getting on? Apart from the odd tantrums, when he's really felt fed up, he's generally been really well. Good, aren't you? So we're normally managing. Yeah. Well done. So, yeah, that pain that was deep in your groin, has that got any better? Yeah. Good. And it's not unsurprising to have pain after the surgery, but the fact that that pain's got better is really reassuring for me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. How's the physio been? All right. Have yeah. you been doing your physio? Yeah. Yeah, it's been doing it, it's fine. The x-ray that we did today, I can't see anything that's worrying on it. Yeah. I'm happy at the six-week mark for him to start getting into a standing frame. Have you got it all? Yeah. 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 So I think we start trying. Well, ideally now, I'm hoping we'll get back to the wheelchair racing yeah. and start trying new activities Definitely. again. And he wants to do tag rugby, wheelchair rugby. Yeah. All the things couldn't do before, which yeah. now, hopefully... Give it the 12-week mark before yeah, we start exactly. doing that, please. <laughs> yeah, Ooh, I don't want to hit you. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, no, that's all the things that I'm hoping we'll be able to get back to. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm really impressed with how much the pain has settled. Having a child come back and they're doing much better after you've operated on them is a lovely feeling. It's a win for them. They've got their surgery. It's a win for me as I've got them through that surgery and I still get that real feeling of joy from it. Any problems in the meantime, let us know. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Take care. Bye. Yeah. He's done really well. Haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Superstar. <laughs> we'll start to plan for the bigger holiday later in the year. Nick can cope with that flight because obviously it's a long flight. Yeah. How long does it take, Max, to Australia? Hours. 24 hours. <laughs> Every case that you do manage to get through the doors and into recovery and onto the ward, it does keep you going. It does. Something has to. At the end of the day, you've all achieved this this big thing that at the beginning of the day we thought was potentially insurmountable. So it's, it's great, I love that feeling. What's it like working in a hospital since the pandemic? Find out more by watching exclusive interviews with NHS staff behind the scenes. Go to bbc.co.uk forward slash saving lives in Leeds and follow the link to the Open University. Mm -hmm.